Hello, my name is Frank Frisella. I'm, I'm an adjunct uh, professor of agronomy at the uh, University of Minnesota. And what I want to talk to you today about is the agroecosystem services of winter oilseed crops. There are two issues involving agriculture, two big issues. There are many issues involving uh, agriculture, but the two that uh, I am most interested in and the two that have received a lot of public attention uh, in the last uh, several years are pollinator health and water quality. I'm going to start uh, uh, talking about pollinator health uh, initially and then uh, uh, switch into water quality using uh, what we hope uh, are solutions uh, to these problems with uh, what we call winter oilseed crops. Now, first of all, uh, with respect to pollinator health, is agriculture responsible for the decline of insect populations? There was a very, very interesting uh, seminar uh, at the uh, most recent Entomological Society of America meetings uh, that were held in St. Louis uh, last November. They had a, pro a, pro a symposium uh, uh, at, at the meeting called the Insect Decline in the Anthropocene, that is the age of man. And they're asking, are insects declining in terms of numbers and species diversity uh, because of agriculture and other human activities? And more or less their conclusion was in agricultural intensification is one of the leading causes of insect declines. At this meeting, there were uh, a number of uh, very uh, famous uh, scientists, two of whom in particular uh, I, I want to mention. One was Dan Jansen and the other one was Peter Raven. Now, both of these guys are old men. One's about 80 years old, the other one's about 90. But they have been famous, very famous biologists uh, for the last 50 to 60 years. When they say things, people sit up and listen, and politicians take notice. So what do these two guys think? Let me just give you some a synopsis of, the, of their two uh, lectures that they gave at the, uh, the ESA meetings last November. Uh, th this, uh, you, you can see here Dan Jansen and his wife Winnie, they work as a team. And basically he concluded that uh, agriculture is unsustainable uh, in the way we practice it today. Uh, Peter Raven, uh, he's the, uh, the pa past uh, director of Missouri Botanical Garden, one of the most fam famous botanical gardens in the world, and he led that the botanical garden for uh, uh, at least 30 years. Uh, and was, was uh, largely responsible for its fame. He also concluded uh, that agriculture is unsustainable and that it, agriculture is driving insects to extinction, as well as other species, uh, groups of, of, of animals as well, and plants. So I'm an agronomist. I've dealt with the, I, I've, agriculture has been, has been part of my life, uh, almost all my working life. So this is disturbing, and I think it's disturbing to a lot of farmers. And so what I want to ask is, how can agronomists help correct this situation? We think we have some answers. Now, the answers that we have probably won't work over the entire world, but at least in the upper Midwest where we live, we think the, the, we have a partial solution. And the partial solution involves these winter oil seed crops. I'm going to be talking about two of them. One's called pennycress, and the other one is called winter camelina. Now, on the left-hand part of the uh, screen that you can see at the moment, you see some flowers of pennycress with a honeybee on, on it, on them. And the uh, next uh, picture is uh, uh, winter camelina flowers with a surfed fly on it. Now, you know the value of honeybees, not only honey, but also the pollination services uh, that... Uh, the uh, honeybees provide. You may not know much about surfed flies, however. They're also called hover flies. And they not only pollinate plants, including cr some crop plants, but their larvae are also interesting. Their larvae are biocontrol agents. Uh, if the larvae, if the eggs are laid on a soybean plant, for example, the uh, surfed larvae will, will eat the, uh, the uh, aphids, uh, soybean aphids on the soybean plant. So natural biocontrol. And if you can promote the populations of these uh, uh, insects, uh, then it's beneficial for everybody, including farmers and society at large. Uh, the other issue, of course, is water quality. And the, uh, the, the image that you see under the, the heading of water quality 
is a camelina field with soybean planted under it. So when that, that camelina was, uh, was sown in the autumn, it start growing in uh, September, October, and into November. Then it became dormant as winter set in. Then in the spring, it started growing again. And at about the time it started growing, soybean were planted underneath, the soybean seeds were planted uh, in amongst it. And now this image was taken at about the end of May or early June when the, uh, the camelina is just finishing flowering, and you can see the soybean growing uh, underneath it. In a few weeks, that soy, the camelina will be uh, mature and will be harvested, and the soybean will be continuing to grow. Now, th so that's called double cropping, and Russ Gesh is going to talk much more about uh, double cropping uh, later. But the image that I want you to see that, that you're looking at at the moment uh, shows uh, uh, camelina at its highest growth stage, basically. Now, it takes a lot of nutrients to get a crop to be look that big, a lot of uh, nutrients like nitrates and phosphates. And that means those nitrates that have been sequestered by that crop are not in the soil uh, where they could be susceptible to leaching down to the water table or on top of the soil where they could be uh, susceptible to runoff after a big water uh, uh, rainstorm or something like that. So that's a potential solution then. You not just have bare ground between those soybean rows, you have living crop plants there sequestering soil nutrients. And I'm going to get more into that in, in a few minutes, but I want to lead uh, with uh, the pollinator uh, insects and pollination services. So uh, even even the president of the United States is interested in pollinator research. In fact, just a few years ago, uh, the, uh, the White House uh, sponsored a report from the uh, Pollinator Health Task Force. And in that report, uh, oh, just to emphasize, now that's the White House image that you see down there. So this is important stuff. And what the White House uh, was uh, uh, indicating, what they want uh, is to identify combinations of plants uh, it, for different geographical regions in the United States that will meet the nutritional needs of honeybees as well as other pollinating insects. And they specifically mention in the report camelina and pennycress. So uh, these crops are not, I don't only think these crops are important, the president of the United States thinks they're important as well. So let's uh, think more about these crops. Now here again, is a uh, soybean in the, in the middle picture is soybean growing underneath a mature crop of pennycress. Uh, and then to the right, the pennycress has been harvested and the soybean is continuing to grow and the soybean will be harvested at the normal time in September. On the left part of the screen, you can see the pennycress crop with a native bee on it. That's not a honey bee, that's a native bee. And the, uh, the crop is bloom, would be blooming nicely, and it would be blooming in either late April or early May. In fact, just the other day, yesterday, May 20th, uh, I was uh, in a pennycress field uh, sampling insect populations, and there were native bees everywhere. It was a beautiful sight to see. Uh, I had to actually catch some of those native bees uh, in, in a sweep net, and then, of course, you have to kill them to preserve them. And I felt guilty about it. However, uh, the fact that we were planting uh, a field of pennycress meant that we were feeding through with nectar as well as pollen thousands upon thousands of these native insects, uh, native bees uh, that serve as pollinators. So uh, they help us, we're helping them, even though we have to kill a few of them in the meantime. Okay, now to show that uh, pennycress and camelina are actually do attract insects, that's what these graphs are to represent. And this data comes from Minnesota as well as South Dakota. Uh, pennycress, the top set of graphs show flower cover. How many, uh, the, the percentage of ground surface area that is covered by flowers of either of these crops, pennycrest or camelina. And then uh, at the same time, we're we are monitoring insect populations. And in some cases, we're and when we survey for insect populations, we have a particular uh, routine that we use. And then we calculate the number of insects we observe on the flowers per minute. And we can uh, have observed in this, these cases up to 60 uh, 
insects per minute. That's one insect per minute on the flowers, in this case, of pennycress. It's actually hard to record data when you have that many insects visiting flowers. Um, but this emphasizes just how many uh, uh, insects do visit these uh, uh, plants uh, during the flowering season of these plants. And the flowering season, as I said before, is late April to early May. No other plants in the upper Midwest flower at that time. No other crop plants flower at that time. There are a few native plants that do, but very like dandelion. Well, actually, dandelion is an introduced plant from Europe. But uh, there's very few uh, other plants uh, that are flowering at that time that are, make food resources for our pollinating insects. These two crop plants do. Now, the next uh, graph, just sh so you can ask, why do they uh, uh, visit these plants? And that's because both plants produce lots of nectar and lots of pollen. Uh, so the, the green bars represent nectar sugar, not just nectar, but the sugar, the amount of sugar in nectar. Uh, and we could have up to about 100 kilograms per hectare, which is about 100 pounds per acre of nectar sugar being produced in this case by camelina flowers. They also produce lots of pollen and pollen is loaded with uh, protein as well as uh, many other vitamins that are important for the uh, sustained health of, of uh, honeybees in particular, but pollinating insects in general. And then the yellow bar with the black hatching that, that you uh, can see, uh, it just represents the number of insects that are visiting those flowers at the, uh, on average. Uh, during the flowering season uh, of those two plants. So these, uh, these plants represent very good resources uh, for those insects and hence, uh, and the insects recognize that, hence the insects visit these flowers. Now, uh, this slide just represents, this is Pennycress uh, flower. And uh, what, I, uh, what I want you to see in the uh, upper left-hand corner uh, is the, the enhanced uh, flower of Pennycress and you can uh, see the pollen sacs uh, here, the yellow pollen sacs. Uh, there should be uh, six of them in each flower. That contain, those contain the pollen. And then down at the base of the petals are the nectaries. These are the nectaries right here. Uh, and that's what's secreting the, uh, the, sh the sugary nectar. And the bees are going for it. And I show you this is because the, uh, some of the scientists the, that at, at the University of Minnesota are specifically studying uh, these issues, nectaries uh, in particular, and nectar production, and the genetics of it. And they are transferring that information to Pennycrest specifically. So in this particular slide, you can see the what we call the wild type Pennycrest, that is the, the normal natural Pennycrest. And you can see the size of the flowers, the very tiny anther sacs that contain the pollen, and then the newer versions of Pennycrest. Uh, that the plant breeders have developed. These have been mutagenized. That it is, they added uh, some a particular chemical uh, to uh, some germinating seeds of pennycress. Uh, that causes a single gene uh, mutation, and then you never know which gene is being mutated. But then you, but you mutate many, many seeds, and then you you germinate them, and then select for the plants that you think are uh, interesting. In this particular case, they're selecting for flower size, and you can see the enormous size uh, of the new mutagenized uh, uh, pennycress flowers. You can see how big the anther sacs are, as and the nectaries are equally large. Nectar size and flower size are, uh, are correlated with one another, and so these flowers are producing much more nectar than the, the wild types do. So it's really interesting research, and you can imagine if you had a field of the mutagenized uh, 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 pennycress compared to the wild type, how much more beneficial that would be for the pollinating insects uh, than the original type. And even the original type of pennycress is very beneficial for the insects. They could be even more beneficial as more breeding work is, is conducted. So very interesting work uh, being done at the University of Minnesota uh, and elsewhere in terms of uh, developing pennycress as a new oilseed crop. Now, the next uh, topic I want to talk about uh, is uh, uh, water quality, especially nitrates in water. 
Uh, many agricultural fields are tile drained in the upper Midwest, and this allows for increased and more reliable uh, production of crops uh, in, in our area. Uh, it's very useful for farmers, very useful for, for crop production to tile drain. And if you're driving through the upper Midwest, you often see uh, outlets from the tile drainage, uh, tile drained fields uh, that look like this with water pouring out of them. Now, unfortunately, uh, drainage water often contains nitrates, that is some of the fertilizer that the crops didn't use from the previous year, uh, leaches down uh, into the soil farther into the soil, the, cr the crop roots can't take it up, but it, it, it is uh, emitted through these uh, tile drains. And uh, that can become a problem. Uh, now, nitrates are, now this uh, typically happens in March uh, through June, um, so with snow melt in March and then rainfall events in April, May, and June. Uh, if it's dry, it doesn't happen. But if it's wet, as it typically is in springtime in the upper Midwest, this can be an issue. Now, nitrates are essential nutrients for, for crop plants and any plant uh, in, uh, in general, uh, but they're dangerous for humans if they get into our drinking water. And at high concentrations, uh, nitrates can also be uh, deleterious for ecosystems. You, you may have heard about algal blooms in lakes and rivers and down in the Gulf of Mexico. Those are due to nitrates and phosphorus, phosphates that uh, escaped our agricultural fields and got into our, our uh, river systems and lakes. Uh, how can we prevent this? Uh, are there ways to do it? Uh, well, this, this map uh, simply shows the agricultural fields. The brown areas uh, in this map are the agricultural uh, fields uh, and then the Mississippi River uh, drainage system. And clearly the Mississippi uh, River Basin is dominated by agriculture. And that means the Mississippi River has uh, the potential of being contaminated by a lot of uh, pollutants that come from agricultural fields, unfortunately. So the idea then, now we know this happens, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and it's, it's not good public relations uh, for agriculture. How do we stop it from happen happening? Well, we think these same two crops that I've been talking about, pennycress and camelina, uh, can help solve this problem, can help eliminate, uh, remove uh, nitrates from the soil solution before they give, ever get into this drainage water. So in this particular slide, you see a young soybean field. And in back of the soybean uh, uh, field is a pennycress field that has soybean planted into it. You can't see the soybean right now, but trust me, in that field of pennycress, there is soybean planted, just like there is in this field that's uh, in, in a, a no-till field. And what uh, uh, this gentleman is, is Russ Gesh, and what he's looking at are two lysimeters. Here's one buried deeply, and here's another one here. What's a lysimeter? Lysimeter is basically a plastic tube that's stuck into the soil, and at the bottom of that plastic tube is a porous ceramic cup. The cup allows water uh, that's in the, uh, the soil to ooze into the cup, and then you can put a suction on the top of that, uh, of the lysimeter, and then draw the water out, and then put the, that water into a flask, bring it to the, to the lab, and analyze it for uh, nitrates and other, other chemicals. And that's what we did in both uh, pennycress, camelina, as well as uh, normal uh, soybean uh, plots. And here are the results. Now, we did that. We, ha we had the uh, the lysimeters buried at 30 centimeters and 60 centimeters, which is basically one foot and two feet. And then we uh, measured how much nitrate was in the water that we uh, vacuumed from those uh, lysimeters. We have several treatments. The normal treatment, uh, the normal treatments are tilled soil and uh, no-till soil where we plant soybean. Those are what, uh, what farmers typically uh, have in their fields. They either plow the soil or they don't plow the soil and they plant soybean into it. And then the treatments that we're really interested in are the pennycress and camelina treatments in the yellow and the green. And we're comparing then how much nitrate is in the soil solution under pennycress and camelina compared to the normal treatments, uh, the till and the no-till or, or the stubble, stubble mulch uh, treatment. 
And what you can see is a considerable reduction in the amount of nitrate in the soil water. That's wonderful news. Now, this is springtime conditions. And that's wonderful news because that's when the nitrates can be leached out of the soil into the water table. And then that water table will flow into uh, adjacent streams and rivers and lakes. So by removing uh, the nitrate uh, from the soil solution, uh, we uh, part at least uh, drastically eliminate that problem from ever happening. So that's very good news and we're very excited about it. Now, the other way uh, nitrates and other uh, uh, soil chemicals can enter our water supplies is through overland flow, often called runoff. Uh, and especially from agricultural fields, which is what you see in this picture. We can measure runoff in small plot areas uh, in the, the manner that you see on the right. And this is called a trough, uh, a Gerloff trough. And uh, it's, it's surrounded by some uh, metal uh, uh, rims here. And that directs water into this funnel. And then the funnel directs any runoff water into a tank. And then we take the water out of that tank, bring it to the lab and analyze it for nitrates and phosphates and so forth. That allows us to compare different treatments like the Pennycrest Camelina treatments uh, and, and compare that to the typical normal situation that farmers typically use uh, when they're planting soybean or any other crop. So similar to the other uh, slide that I just showed you, here's the normal situation where we have the tillage or no tillage. Uh, in both autumn and in spring, and we're comparing that to the pennycress and winter camelina, and looking at the amount of nitrate in the uh, water that uh, ran off of those, uh, those plots through those uh, uh, troughs. And again, what you see is a drastic reduction in the amount of nitrate uh, in those water samples. So, uh, Pennycress and winter camelina have the potential to drastically uh, reduce the problem, nearly eliminate the problem of water contamination uh, of our agricultural uh, uh, from our agricultural fields. So we think that's great news. So what's the uh, value of winter oil seed crops? Well, they have the potential to sustain and maybe improve pollinator health to sequester soil nutrients and preserve water quality. And then I haven't talked about the, the following uh, three items, but Russ uh, Gesh will. Uh, the, these same crops have the ability to magnify crop production without increasing acreage of crop production. So we're growing two crops on the same site at the same time. Add income to farmers' pocketbooks. No one can complain about that and diversify our agricultural markets, which will also increase the employment opportunities for our fellow citizens. So that's what I wanted to tell you about, uh, about winter uh, oilseed crops. And uh, I think we'll have a, a question and answer period at some other uh, point in time. Thank you very much for your attention.